everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to welcome my colleague and friend from Hopkinsville Community College. This is Dr. John Davis. Uh, we were in a meeting uh, a few months back, and Dr. Davis mentioned something about having a book. And I was like, oh, you have a book? Because, uh, you know, we, we love us some authors around here at West Kentucky. And then I asked him what his book was about. And then I was like, okay, now you really have to come to West Kentucky because I just thought this was fascinating. And the more he described his study and uh, the research that he had done, I just thought it was a wonderful way to really um, personify the importance of general education and the way that all of our disciplines can work together in looking at a problem, looking at an issue, looking at a historical event, and taking all those things into account can really help us to understand something. So the other thing that I liked about it was that I thought that it really spoke well to so many of our academic areas and that our students and our faculty could really benefit from being here. So I want to take just a minute, and forgive me for not having memorized your biography, but I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Davis before he comes and talks to you today. So uh, John P. Davis is a native Kentuckian. He is an assistant professor of history at Hopkinsville Community College. He's been there for five years. Prior to that, uh, he taught at Ohio State University. He was a junior faculty fellow there and lecturer, and then he was at the University of Kentucky before that, where he received his PhD in Russian history, which he told me earlier would, um, he thought he would kind of corner the market on that, that that would be something <laughs> weird and obscure, and he would be like the guy who did Russian history, but it turns out that a lot of people like Russian history a whole lot, so it's not quite as obscure. Maybe Mongolian history. I was, Mongolian, that would yeah, be good. Yeah, that would have been a good one. Um, the Mongols, yeah. <laughs> so he's the author of Russia in the Time of Cholera, Disease Under the Romanovs and Soviets, and to write the book, he did six months of archival research in Russia in several different places. He worked at the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda, Maryland, and at the Summer Research Laboratory at the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Center at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Prior to his academic career, he worked for 20 years as a police officer, so behave today. And he retired in 2003 as a lieutenant and patrol commander in the Florence, Kentucky Police Department. So if you will, uh, help me welcome Dr. John Davis to our stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here at the, the oldest community college in Kentucky. Is that correct? Probably so. Yeah. And, and uh, the most well-established and a beautiful place you have here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm John Davis. I'm here today to talk about my book, Russia in the Time of Cholera, Disease Under Romanovs and Soviets. It was, at first, uh, the idea was that we were going to make it disease and the environment. Uh, under Ro Romanovs and so but the environment got cut, but you'll still, still see a lot of environmental influences in here uh, as, as we go through. Uh, that is the cover of, of the book. It is uh, published by I.B. Taurus, which is a company in, in London, and uh, it was in, very interesting working for, with them and, and for them. Okay, this is a, uh, a statement that I have at the beginning of my book. It, it kind of explains uh, the study of disease in general, and I really like it. Uh, so I, I use I tell my students not, not to use things that, that is neat, but I had to use this because it's neat, right? Uh, diseases change and have a history of their own, which depends upon a possible modification of bacteria and vi viruses and of the human landscape in which they live. Um, Fernand Braudel. So you, you, a good book, what's a good book without some French guy saying something at, at the beginning, right? Um, but Mirko Gromek actually is, is, is the, the historian who he was paraphrasing. But this is part of the story, is that the cholera changes. It, it's not the same disease over the 100 years. It, it evolves. It's not the same disease always that it is today. Uh, and and the, the more we study it, the more complex it gets, and the more we, we learn about it. OK. Uh, these are the, just, I thought we'd start out with the major contributions of, of the book, uh, w the way I see it, the, the things that are important. Now, I teach my students, always have a thesis, 
Uh, and, and my thesis really is that uh, Russia's struggle with Collard mirrored the industrialization of the country. In, in that respect, um, its location and place in the Euro European diplomatic system, that uh, Russia's experience with Collard is normal, or was normal. Now, a lot of scholars are, are tend to, to really hinge on this idea that, that Russia was backward. Their, their physicians were backward, their medical system was backward, and that's why they have cholera after the beginning of the 20th century when it had disappeared in, uh, th in Western Europe. Uh, but as I will hopefully just uh, demonstrate to you today, Russia's experience was, was totally normal, although um, to the time, right? Their place in the, in the diplomatic order and in and their, their, their location at the end, the eastern end of, of, of Europe, right? and one-sixth of the world's land service. That might be problematic a little bit. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. Uh, Russia's environmental approach to disease was not backward or an anachronistic, but actually rather advanced. This is part of, my of what I argue about. Now, physicians or are, are, are historians are saying, well, Robert Cook uh, isolated the cholera vibrio in 1883, therefore they should not have had cholera after 1883, and as proof, Western Europe did not have cholera after 1883. Uh, actually, they did. They did. And they had a huge epidemic at Hamburg in 1892. They know about that, but that's considered uh, by, by the historian, uh, Richard Evans, a very good historian, a, a wonderful historian. He's a uh, professor of modern history at, at Cambridge, so he's very good. But this is not an anomaly, and, and, and it's very easily explained, and, and I'll explain it. Uh, a lot of the scientific knowledge has, has come out recently uh, on new scientific knowledge on cholera, and my book is based upon that as well. Um, cholera, cholera epidemics in Russia did not subside due solely to superior sanitation under the Soviets. Uh, but as part of a struggle with cholera, the disease, uh, it, it basically just run its course, and, and what the Russian physicians found out that they needed to do was just try to wear it down. They were not able to build uh, a sanitary infrastructure that would just knock out the disease. If, if, you, if, you, if they could have done that, they probably would have been able to. They were not able to. They didn't have the money. They, they had too much, and they had a lot of turmoil in Russia, as you, you'll see uh, in our story. Uh, a civil war, a couple, of, um, a couple of revolutions, actually three revolutions in, in about 12 years, and uh, really some of the worst uh, social conditions in history. Okay. Um, so they, they, they took a Darwinist approach to disease. Uh, they, they were really interested in immunity and their vaccination program. In the West here, if you go somewhere today, has anybody been vaccinated for cholera? Probably not, right? When I went to Russia, they vaccinated me for, for typhoid, but not cholera. Cholera is seen as a, a disease in which vaccination is, is it doesn't work, right? It's, it, and it is, it's, it's, it's a little bit unreliable. It's, compared to the other diseases. Uh, typhoid it works very well. You, you, you get vaccinated, you probably, almost certainly are not gonna get it. But cholera, it didn't work that way. And as you'll see, the, the, the physicians had, uh, they, they found a clever way of using it. But what they found was, was that it gave six months protection. Therefore, if they could immunize people who were, who were expected to get hit, they could stop the disease, and that, that's exactly what they did, sort of, sort of like the, uh, the WHO and some of these organizations do today. Okay, recognition of the role of material forces in, in uh, cholera, such as climate, economics, and the human organism, famine. Uh, when you say the, the human landscape, that the, the Russian physicians came to understand the human landscape as in human intestines as well, right? Uh, we, we study the intestines and see what is going on there. Um, so, so these are some of the, the, the um, major contributions. Here, here's a few more. The Soviets built on Imperial Russia's flexible strategy and infrastructure to control cholera epidemics. They, they had a flexible system of, of um, they, they never thought for a minute that they could stop it at the border. This is one sixth of the world's land mass, right? If you're in Germany and you have a lot of people and, 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 and not nearly the border, you could maybe set up a quarantine and, and stop people from coming into your country. One sixth of the world's land mass is, is, is a little bit hard, to, to uh, difficult to, to go along the borders and stop everybody. And, and anyway, they understood that it, that it probably lived there. And, and it, as it turns out, they were almost certainly right that the cholera does live in southern Russia, uh, in Astrakhan, 
and, and, and on the Volga in various cities for a long, long time. Uh, recent studies have, have said that. So uh, superior sanitation helped a lot, but, but uh, and, and so they looked at nutrition, vaccination, and immunity. And, and nutrition, they, just the, the simple act of feeding people probably saved lots and lots of lives. In the 1920s, under Lenin's new economic policy, the, uh, the Soviets just started to feed people. I mean, they, they had, in 1921, they had a famine which killed millions of people. I mean, just horrible, just horrible, horrible things. You know, um, I, I, I'll spare you the, the, the uh, description, but it was just a horrible time in Russia. And, and think, think about uh, Dr. Zhivago, how, how terrible it was, and, and it got worse. And they just started feeding people, and, and guess what? The ep epidemic diseases dropped drastically, almost to nothing just for people getting, getting fed. Uh, when you think of the, the, the I, I know of, of very few cholera epidemics where there was not some type of a famine. Uh, you, you think of the, the epidemic going on in Yemen right now with a million deaths and one of the worst famines in history. Uh, cholera is a famine-related disease. Certainly, the, the history shows that. Okay, so they were concerned with nutrition, vaccination, and immunity. If somebody doesn't fall ill, you know, the, or, or even if, if, if they got a minor case or something. But if they could induce immunity, they, they could stop cholera. And, and that was part of their strategy. Uh, and also, and, and, and here's sort of my uh, argument wrapped up. It, it's a Darwinist approach that emphasized broad causal aspects, especially immunity during the Soviet new economic policy. Lenin was smart enough that he understood that uh, we have to bring up the social conditions in this country or we're not going to survive. And in fact, they, they, they were very lucky to, to hang around as a, a, a group. OK. So um, they built on uh, uh, Imperial Russia's flexible strategy. OK, I, I think I, I did that already, right? <laughs> OK. All right. Um, well, going the wrong way here. All right. Uh, this is the Russian Empire th at 1900. And you see, this is really a, a, a map of empire. The world in 1900 was still an, an empire world, right? You see that Britain, this is not, of course, Britain. This is British India and, and Britain, Britain, Britain. Uh, still Persian, not Iraq and Iran yet, but already Afghanistan. OK, so cholera, the reason I have this map in here is, is just a, a, a general idea of, of what happens with cholera. It, it, uh, it is developed here pretty much in the Bay of Bengal right here at, uh, you have a pretty conducive environment for cholera developing there. Right about up here somewhere, you, I, I don't know if these are them or not, but you have the uh, Himalaya Mountains, uh, which are, they're pretty high, right? Mount Everest, the highest in the world, actually, right? Uh, so you get a lot of runoff, which runs down into northern India and along the Indus River and along the Ganges River, uh, which is where cholera is, is considered the home of cholera. This is where it, 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 it just is endemic more than in any other place. Uh, along with that, uh, you have the, this area here. This is called the Sunda Arc of Indonesia. This is where about um, 100, uh, of, of 100 volcanoes are going at all times. And you have some of the, well, you had actually the two or three largest uh, volcanoes in history in the Sunda Arc during this period that, that we're discussing from uh, during the, uh, the 19th and early 20th century, but the 19th century. And this has major implications up here, as we'll talk about. Uh, this is, it's related to the El Nino uh, Southern Oscillation. So generally before a cholera epidemic, or, or right at about that time, you'll have a, the, the El Nino will cycle, uh, which, right, I mean, this is like in Mexico, right? I mean, you, you get teleconnections across the ocean, which affects this area, this so-called butterfly effect. We, we talk, a butterfly flaps its wings, and something happens a thousand miles away. That, this, is, this is it. Uh, the atm it has to do with the atmos atmospheric pressure. But you, you will get, uh, so what you're going to see is some volcanoes here, and then very close by, uh, you have actions within the ocean itself, changes in tides. Um, the the, the, the uh, volcanoes and the, the El Ninos can mess up the, uh, the Asian monsoon. And if the Asian monsoon does not cycle normally, 
it, 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 it doesn't go off for a while, right? You don't get the monsoon. You get drought. You get drought, you, you have crop failure, or it's beginnings of crop failure, right? Then when it, when it comes back, when, when it finally does rain, you get a torrential downpour, which makes it even worse because a lot of these areas are, are, are conducive to flooding, which kills the crops even more, kills a lot of people too, uh, generally. But floods and famines and, and, and droughts really cause cholera epidemics. They, um, you, you, you start having processes within this ocean right here, and this is, is the Bay of Bengal estuary, right? So does anybody know what an estuary is? But, uh, kind of, I, I always wondered about that word. And you hear this word brackish water, right? It's really supposed to mean, to mean uh, dirty water, right? But really what it is, is, is a mixture of salt and, and, and uh, fresh water. So you have all this fresh water coming down into all this salt water, um, and sitting on the bottom of the, of, of the bay is cholera in, a, in an unfinished state, right? It's, it's ready to go. It just needs some, some nutrition to get it going. And what happens is these, these tides and these temperatures kick up um, nutrients in the bottom. Uh, nitrogen, I think, is, the, is one of the big ones. But uh, they kick up th these uh, nutrients from the bottom sediments, which start to activate the cholera, which then, in, in probably in anaerobic environments, and it, are moved up into aerobic environments uh, where it can live, it can live in both, by a carrier by the name of copepods. Has anybody ever heard of copepods? It's a shrimp-like, uh, little shrimp-like fish that carries it, or shell, shellfish, crustacean, which carries the, the, the vibrio, the cholera vibrio, and we'll talk a little bit about that, up into Larger shell, the, the guts of larger shellfish, which eat it, uh, crabs, clams, uh, and then who eats it next? Human beings. Yeah. So this literally goes from, from through the gut tracts of, of, of three different uh, animals, right? And, uh, and, and this is really how the cholera epidemics of the, of the 19th century and, and early 20th century begin, although these processes can take place in, in just about any estuary. Uh, here is, are the conditions which really are conducive to cholera. Uh, it, it's just an or, it's such an organic uh, with, with, uh, environment with all of this runoff and with all of, this is a very rich organic area. Actually was not even inhabited until 1000, uh, the, at the, the uh, Bronze Age collapse when you have the, the Iron Age come along, the Aryans, uh, because you needed, you needed uh, iron implements to even clear this place. There's so much organic material there. And in, and in estuaries, uh, where, where a lot of diseases start, uh, you, you have, uh, it's one of the most organic places in the world. It's more organic than, than similar grass uh, uh, jungles and, and, and uh, areas, right, where, where you think of as organic areas. So this is a very much a, an, an environment that is prone to cholera. Cholera, it comes out of here through carriers, up along the trade routes, and either around by the Oral Sea into Russia, or through between the Caspian and Black Sea. And, and it, 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 time and time and time again, it enters right through here in, in, in the first time in, in, 19, in uh, 1823, and guess where it exited? Right through here in, in the 1920s. So this is the normal spread of cholera. Almost all the major pandemics originated in this area and then spread west. Uh, the United States got hit very hard in, in the mid 19th century in some of these. Okay, I think I've done a thorough enough job of covering that that I, that I can move on. All right, and there's the Sunda Arc again, uh, which is very, and this is where all, where the, uh, all the, the this, uh, volcanic activity is. Okay, so trade and, and, and empire had, had a lot to do with the, the trade in Russia, had a lot to do. This is also 1900. This is the commerce in Russia. And, and this is, is, is the, uh, the Black Sea, and here's the Caspian. You see, this is the Volga River, and you can just see the, the immense amount of trade coming up that river, uh, all the way up to a place called Rybinsk, and then around, up and around to St. Petersburg. That's a series of canals up there 
which are, were, were called, uh, is still called the Mariansky system, the Mariansky system. And it br brought, disproportionately brought power to St. Petersburg than Moscow even, right? You would think Moscow would, would get hit first. Well, it, it actually just sort of went around Moscow. Uh, this is on heights, so it had better water sources because it's on heights. Went around and struck St. Petersburg. So there's all this idea that St. Petersburg, uh, the, the, the public health system wasn't as good. Uh, they couldn't build water sources. Well, they couldn't build water sources because it's down very low, right, in an estuary. And you have, does anybody know anything about St. Petersburg? You have all these channels through, go, going through it, the Fontanka, the Moika. I mean, they call it the Venice of the North, right? Uh, so, and, and, these, and these are estuaries on the Baltic Sea up here. So these, St. Petersburg, its location was a perfect place for cholera. There are no other places in Europe like these places. Ashra Khan right here has just a, a, an immense archipelago of small islands and estuaries. It's just the perfect place for cholera to live, and, and, and it definitely lived there uh, throughout the, this period and would, would show up time and time again. What you have often is cholera will appear over here and then almost immediately cases will, will, will pop up over here. So much that, that they were watching the Volga so much that they thought these were the first cases when sometimes down here you had the first cases. So you can see the, the, the effect of trade. Most of this trade is going to Western Europe. Russia was an exporter. The Romanovs were trying to be a, a, a European empire. They wanted to be, they, I mean very badly wanted to be a European empire. And so they were industrializing very fast. Uh, There's a lot of other aspects like, like migrant workers coming and being on the outside of towns where there's, where there's no sanitation. So sanitation did play a, a big role. Okay, and there again, this is, is the, this Mariansky system. Um, you see where it, it comes up and it goes over the top and, and goes, th this is a system of canals on the Shechma, Shechna and Malog and this late white lake and then it comes up and over to Lake Latiga and then into the Neva and into to St. Petersburg. And that's how cholera, that was the normal route, and, and, the, and the route is going where? It's going to, to, to Western Europe. This is how the Hamburg epidemic actually took, happened in 1892. Um, it, it, it's really no surprise what happened. It, it, from St. Petersburg across the top uh, of the Baltic Sea, you, you had uh, the Hamburg-America line, which brought cholera to Hamburg, and even brought it to, to New York, where, where, where people stood uh, with ball bats <laughs> saying, don't, don't let them people off, you know? So uh, it's, easier to, it's easier to do a quarantine when you know you have a few ships coming in in one place, right? It's not very easy to do a quarantine over here, uh, in Russia where you have this immense problem. Okay. All right, and here's the cholera, the, the blue death they call it. Uh, people would, would get this and, and basically it's, it's a bacteria, it gets into your intestines, and um, basically just sucks, sucks the water out of you, dry. You, you, um, your, your cheeks get very sunken in, as you can see the, the victim here. Uh, your eyes get hollow, um, and, and even you get horrible cramps. Horrible cramps to the extent that sometimes when people would die, their bodies would move after they were dead because the, the, the muscle spasms that they had. So this was a horrible death, and, and it was, I mean, just think of being cramped to death. Anybody suffer from cramps like I do occasionally? It hurts, it hurts really bad. Um, and, and this was not a good way to die. Nobody wanted to die of it, and it, it scared people to death. Um, so it, it, it is a, a, a um, it, it's, it's a waterborne disease. Uh, it, it's known as the cholera vibrio. It looks like, or the cholera comma, they originally called it. It looks like a little comma. Okay. Russian cholera, 1823, you, you, you had the first cases to 1922. Um, actually, that, that should be probably about 1926. Five point, but, but the statistics are for uh, these particular years. 5.5 million cases, 2.2 million deaths, 50 cholera years in which you had more than just a few cases uh, that, where it was a problem for them. They had to deal with it. That's, 50 out of uh, 100 years. Okay, in the late, so, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the different um, cholera epidemics and, and, and the effect of weather and, and, and what it happens, uh, how it affects cholera epidemics and how it affects uh, so Russian history, czarist history and Soviet history. 
the, the Tsarist, the, the Romanov dynasty was formed in 1613 after what, what we now know as the Smutnoya Vremia, the, the time of troubles. Uh, you, you had, uh, after Ivan the Terrible died, he had, he had actually murdered his son, uh, Dmitri, and you had uh, three false Dmitris, and, 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 a, and a, just a period of terrible turbulence where they, they, no, nobody would recognize the Tsar. Poland took it, took it over, the, the, the false Dmitris were Poland, they actually put one of those guys, when they figured out they were false, they put him in a cannon and shot him back to Poland. Uh, really a nasty time. 1605, Boris Godunov was killed in a, in a palace coup. A lot of violence, a lot of turmoil. Finally, they found this 15-year-old kid who they said uh, had some type of a, of a relationship, uh, weak relationship probably to Ivan the Terrible, and said, okay, you're, you're the czar. So Mikhail Romanov became the first czar in 1613. Um, and, and, and this was in the period of the colder temperatures during the Little Ice Age. So you had a lot of turmoil. Uh, and, and so Russia, uh, the, the, the Tsarist or, or Romanov Empire, began with climate change and, it, and more or less is going to end with it or, or, or with, uh, and, and disaster and, and a time of troubles. Okay, uh, 1902 to 1921. We'll talk about that. That's the second time of cholera during the sixth cholera pan pandemic, and we'll get to that. Um, volcanic activity famine in the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, if, if you recall, the, the, the climate, you had a lot of volcanic activity, you had poor climate, and you had bad harvest, failing harvest, which is w one of the major reasons that you had the bread riots. The women come out onto the street and, and did bread riots. And when women come out on the street and start rioting, the society's about ready to crumble. It, re it really is. The same thing will happen in Russia. The, the women, women, female bread riots uh, are, are what will vault a society over the edge. Um, so we, we know that that happened, and you had the French Revolution, Napoleon run rampant all over Europe, uh, and, and finally defeated by, and, and by Wellington, right, at Waterloo. Uh, about the same time that you have the, uh, the Vienna Conference and also an eruption in t uh, the, the, the Sunda Arc of Indonesia, uh, the Trambora Volcano, which is the strongest volcano still of all time, stronger than all 5,559 eruptions since the Ice Age, uh, the last Ice Age. Uh, so in recorded history, to this day, T Tambora was the strongest volcano ever. So 1816 is called the, the, so the year without summer. You had volcanic ash and, and all this in the sky blocking out the sun, basically. You have uh, Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein, you know, and, 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 it, and a, a really good um, scholar from up here at Illinois named Stephen D'R.C. Wood said that, that Frankenstein was, was really these, co these people who were starving to death, who would wander in the city, scaring people to death. Right. The, uh, so I, I, that makes a lot of sense. So, and, and the, the first cholera epidemic came the, the following year uh, in 18, well, you had cholera right away in 1815, but, but it did not become a pandemic. It did not come out of, of uh, India until 1817 when Lord Hastings' army, which was fighting uh, the Maratha War, oh, oh, it's really a war for commerce and empire, uh, suffered thousands and thousands of deaths to, to the extent where he, he moved his, his camp up onto a high ground and, and, and saved a lot of lives. But this was really the first modern pandemic, and, and, and cholera has really been endemic in many places since then. Um, so it did not hit Russia at first. And in 1822, you have a, the Tsarist war against Persia. The Tsars were always trying to push out their borders, right? They wanted to be a, a, a European empire, and the only way to do that is to take other land. And they felt that this was, was survival, that this was really, we either get stronger or somebody will, will, will take us over. We'll end up being a British protectorate. And, we, and they didn't want to do that. And, and truthfully, they, they, wanted to, they wanted to be the, the bully, right, they, they, uh, rather than the British. So they, they, they're pushing out. Um, and then you had some, some famine, probably caused by, by the, uh, the, the war and, and probably some uh, uh, climate activity. So in 1823, you get cholera in Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, which is that area right between 
the, uh, uh, the, the two uh, oceans, uh, or seas rather, uh, and we don't know how many cases, but there were 392 cases and 205 deaths in Ashra Khan at, at the top of the Caspian Sea, which we're, we're, we're sure. The, the Russian government really did nothing. I mean, they, were, they figured, what can we do? How can, how can we you know, come against this disease, which it's, it's lightning fast, and movement in those days was not lightning fast. It was, it was uh, pretty much turtle slow. Okay. Uh, the hungry 40s in the second pandemic, and, and I'm sorry, that's 1829 uh, in Russia that it was. Uh, you, you, you had another wave of cholera epidemics. It, it basically the, uh, a continuation of the first uh, epidemics. It was brought by Persian caravans across the border, and then uh, it, it basically just lasted through, it lasted into the, 19, the 1830s, right up to about 1835. The time, the time it started subsiding, uh, you, you had some volcanic activity. In the mid-30s, you started having another round of volcanic activity just when it was ending and brought it right back uh, in the 1840s. The 1840s are called the Hungry 40s. You had mass starvation all over Europe. It, you may know, have heard of one, the Irish famine. Uh, people were starving all over Europe. And, and so it was just a haven for cholera epidemics. You had by far more cholera epidemics in the 1840s than any other time. The 1848 uh, pandemic, at the, at the time of the 1848 revolution, which was the largest series of revolutions in history, this is no coincidence at all. When you have, you have this type of famine, people not eating, you have people on the street. Anybody seen well-fed people go out on the street? I've never seen that. Mostly, they're, they're, you have to be starving to go out, to be angry enough to go out and fight with the police uh, on a mass scale. So th this, again, you had another bout of, of, of this famine, revolution, and the, and the volcanic activity. In Russia, 2.5 million cases and 1 million deaths of, of cholera alone. Uh, the famine probably killed m much, much more. Okay, the third pandemic in, in 1852 to 59 was brought about, a lot of it was brought about by the Crimean War. A war will always create the conditions. Soldiers are not well-fed. Populations are not, actually the soldiers often are well-fed, but the populations around there are not well-fed. They're not getting uh, the, the, the water they need, the pure water. Water sources get uh, contaminated. So you had famine at the British front, uh, which almost certainly contributed to the 1854 cholera epidemic in London. This is a very famous cholera epidemic in which uh, Dr. John Snow goes out and becomes an epidemiologist. He, he, he maps the disease. And he comes up with the idea that it's coming out of, of, of the a pump on Broad Street. And he's, he tells them to close the pump. They close the pump, and the epidemic stops. So uh, he had traced it to this. It, it was because, and, and this is really what, what spreads cholera. It, uh, when you have these real, what I call classical cholera epidemics, explosive epidemics, is when the, the water source for a population gets, gets uh, uh, contaminated. You, ha you have what is, you have like rising, catastrophically rising uh, uh, casualties, then you have just a little bit of falling off, and then they start to drop, and then you have a long tail, like if you're looking at it on a, uh, uh, a, a graph, uh, one of those, um, uh, what do you call them, bell curves. It, it's definitely not a bell curve. In, in Russia, on the Russian side, now this, is, this was a war between the British and French and the Russians, right? They actually, the British and French actually teamed up with the Turks. They wanted to keep the Russians out of the Straits, the, the uh, Constantinople, and the Russians wanted to get out into the sea. Does this sound familiar? I mean, this is, this is a lot of the stuff with the Caucasus right now is, is still geopolitics over the Straits. Uh, no, there's no way that the West is ever gonna let Russia out, out there. Um, but a fellow by the name of Nikolai Pirogov in Russia was at the front, and he's just sorting through all these bodies, and he says, you know, uh, these people are starving. You know, we, we, use, it's useless to treat them if, you know, if what we need to do is feed them. So, so this is one of their major ideas that, that never goes away, although it, 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 they never get it well enough do, down uh, during the Tsarist era to stop cholera epidemics. The fourth pandemic was brought by the Hajj, the Muslim Hajj, um, and also uh, you had some famine and, and inso events. Uh, that is just um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation inso. And, and uh, in Russia, you have 
the, the beginning of the great reforms in terms of medicine in the 1860s by Prerogov himself. He was one of the main catalysts. And it's such a poor country that, I mean, comparatively, and you have so many people and you have so much trouble feeding people that the idea was we will build a system based on preventive care. You know, this is, this is really all we can do. It, it, it's this, all Russian physicians were saying, why even try to treat them when, when they, they, need to, they need to eat? This is the first thing they need. So uh, you, you had, the, this actually lasted, you had sporadic cholera epidemics up right up, in, and some horrible stuff happened in China during these years due, during, due to the El, El Nino and, um, and, and some of the famine in China. Millions of people drowned. But uh, in 1883, you had another volcanic uh, eruption at the Sunda Arc, uh, half, about half the, the size of, of the, uh, the, the Pandora, or, or the, the, the Tambora volcano, and you have another epidemic. Uh, Robert Koch, at the same time, is, is isolating the cholera vibrio, so that today we know about the cholera vibrio. He, he sees it under a microscope. He had more powerful microscopes. And this is the idea of why, why is it there? I mean, they know what it was. Why didn't they just set up a quarantine and stop it? Why don't you, you know, keep, keep it out like the West did? Uh, you only have the, you do have the Hamburg epidemic that year, but other than that, it, it's, it's kind of sporadic. It's along, it's along the Spanish coast. It's just, it's not as strong, but the, the Krakatoa volcano makes it strong again, and it, and it, and it hits Russia with, with, in really terrible force. You had Russian construction of railroads along the borders. Uh, you had all that trade that I, that I just showed you, and it, it hits Russia very strong. You had uh, about six, yeah, 600,000 plus cases and 295 plus deaths um, in, in 1892. The 1892 is, is known as, as really a, a, a horrible epidemic, and, and the physicians said, we, we really have to do something about this. Uh, and th you had some attempts to feed people. All along here, the Tsarist had a, 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 an anti uh, famine policy, but it just never really was worked well enough. Uh, so now you have this, the great reforms in Zemstvo medicine. You have a, an organization called the Prerogov Society, which resolves to feed people. And, and so at, in the next pandemic, that's going to probably make a difference. Uh, you start in the late 1890s, you have the great famine in India, with, where you have mi literally millions of people starving and, and dying. To, uh, something like 25 to 30 million people, the great famine killed in India. Um, but it doesn't hit Russia until, until 1902. Why? Because in the bottom, uh, around the, the base of, of Russia, where it would come in, the Prerogov Society starts to feed people in and, and, and mass, massive numbers. The government didn't like this, right? The, 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 they're treading on their territory. So they, had them, they made them curtail this uh, feeding. And uh, it, it, when they are curtailing it, you can see it starting to show up. So it, 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 it Appears in Siberia in 1902. Uh, you have a, a short case, although there's unreported casualties in Astrakhan. They they, they hit it. The Tsarist government hit it. And then you have in, in Saratov in 1904 uh, a, a pretty good outbreak. But it happens in October. It happens late, where where the, they were basically saved by the weather. But they know it's going to come back. So they they have this huge cholera conference in 1905, uh, which is commensurate with the 1905 revolution. They actually uh, protest against the government. Uh, but the disease does not come back until 1907 in Samara, which is about halfway up the Volga River, right? And so what's doing way up there? So this, this idea comes about that, that it just lives there, and it just had, been, had come back, right? Um, we don't know. You, know it, 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 you had a pretty good uh, epidemic in Persia. And, and you also probably had some prior, uh, some prior cases in Ekaterin Ekaterinoslav province on the Black Sea, which comes out later. You did have those. It could have uh, been transported up to Samara, or it could have been, uh, it, it could have simply just appeared in both places at the same time. It, 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 to this day, we really don't know, but we do know there were some prior cases in 1907. Uh, to the Samara epidemic. Uh, cholera really never leaves at, at this point. It, it really remains endemic. 
Uh, the following, it lives through the winter. The following year, it, 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 a, a case manifests at Tsaritsyn, which is now Stalingrad, or was Stalingrad for a while. It, uh, it, it's um, Volgograd now. And then you have the, the great St. Petersburg epidemic of 1908. That is the second large pan, uh, epidemic in St. Petersburg since 1892. You you're going to end up with three classical cholera epidemics in St. Petersburg over a period of about uh, uh, 25 years. This is, this is very rare to have that many. Uh, I don't know of any other city that got hit like that. The, and then you have the epidemic of 1910. And in the epidemic of 1910, 230, 232 cases, uh, 1,000 cases, uh, over 109 fatalities. All 72 provinces in Russia are affected. This is the first time that any disease had ever penetrated every single, uh, every single place in Russia, basically, right? So why, why is it, can it do that? Uh, what the physicians are, are, find, are figuring out is that it's, it's, it's evolving. It's, it's becoming smaller or, or, or weaker, and it can, it can live longer, and it's adapting to the environment. So it, 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 and it is getting to all these fresh uh, populations that have not been affected prior. Okay, World War I and the Moscow epidemic of, of 1915. You have, uh, World War I breaks out, you have a, a massive retreat in 1915 from the, from the front, and uh, they, bring, they bring cholera from Eastern Europe where it had, it had broken out, to, to Moscow, but so it's very rare to see Moscow get hit like this without it coming up. This is, this is totally different than, than prior epidemics. Uh, about 30,000 cases in Moscow, but the mortality rate is incredibly low. Not that many people die, and they, they, they can't figure it out, but they had a, um, a, a, a system of vaccination. Uh, a female named Glodova uh, was in charge of it, and really, uh, I think probably this allowed for the, uh, along with the good conditions in Moscow, people, although you did have a, a famine at that time, but uh, some famine, but people were probably eating okay, uh, and you had, you had some vaccination. So the, the, the uh, mortality rate was actually very low. Again, it's seen, uh, Russia's seen as, as being backwards for this. Uh, the St. Petersburg epidemic again of 1918, another terrible epidemic. All of these are about as big as the Hamburg epidemic, about seven or 8,000 uh, cases. And then you, you go, you know, the, the, you have two, in 1917, you have the two um, uh, revolutions, and then you have uh, the Civil War, where the Reds against the Whites, the Great Famine and the Cholera epidemic of 1921, you have, and 1921 was just a terrible year in Russia. It was just as bad as any of the years. Uh, you had another Great Famine, 204,228 cases. Uh, the number of deaths were not even recorded. Probably just as bad as 1910, really, if the truth be known. Uh, but Lenin, at this time, you know, the Soviets are fighting for survival in this, in this uh, civil war, and he comes to the idea that we, we, just, we just have to raise the social level of these people up. You know? So this is where the idea where they get, we're, we're just gonna start feeding people and, and taking better care of them. It's the new economic policy. He, he undoubtedly got this from the Pirogov Society and, and, outcome, and it come out of the great reforms. Lenin was very pragmatic and he also always followed Tsar's protocol. He, 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 he didn't like people trying to invent new things. So this, this idea that this is some new type of medicine, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an improved type of medicine over what it had been, but it, it had been around all this time and uh, he, he institutes the new economic policy. They have pri some private markets. People can sell, uh, you, you, and under the communists, you could not. And, and they even had grain rec requisitioning, which caused this problem. The, the, the Bolsheviks uh, had requisitioned grain from people, and, and you got the big famine, and you got the, uh, the cholera epidemics. So, um, so at this point, you have, you have uh, in 1921, what happens in St. Petersburg? No epidemic. No epidemic for the first time. And, and they're just befuddled by this. Uh, how, how can that possibly be, right? Well, it, it can be because you had famine in Moscow, you had famine in, in uh, Saratov, which are the two places that get hit. And you still have sporadic fighting in the south uh, in Saratov right up until 1924, when, when some of the last cases uh, are, are when, when cholera is departing Russia. 
Okay. Uh, so you have Russian civil war. Uh, it's still going on in southern Russia into about 1924, but co while cholera is withdrawn, but it's bringing it with it. And you have one of the last major flare-ups in southern Russia, um, a, a little town, I, I, can't, I can't think of the name of it right offhand. But uh, this is definitely due to the Civil War. Okay, there's the cholera in the Soviet Union in 21 and 22. You can see it's endemic. It lives there. It never leaves. It's, it's in there every single month, right, uh, in 1921 and 1922. Two years, uh, cholera just stayed there. So the, the Russian physician's idea that cholera was endemic to their country was certainly correct. Okay. Here's Collar's retreat from Europe, and, then, and, and we'll wrap it up with this, and, and I'll open up the questions. You see in 1923, you have some, some big cases out here, uh, a, a big epidemic, 300 or more uh, out uh, towards, uh, actually towards Siberia, and, and underneath Moscow, another one. You have some really, you have 1,000 deaths down here in Persia, and another one in Iraq here, but, um, and some around the, the Azov Sea, or just north of the Black Sea there. So this is where, and, and there, it's still pretty strong at this point uh, in 1923. Okay, in 1924, again, you have, the, you, it's stubbornly clinging in this area of Moscow. They finally go, go to these areas, Pinza was one of them, and just, and just saturate the place with vaccination. Down, uh, again, on Azov, it's just kind of come around it a little bit, and you, st you see these, these have moved a little bit, but pretty much it's stubbornly clinging in 1924, and then there it is. It's, 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 it's leaving. It's, it's leaving. This is Carler deporting Europe, uh, departing Europe in 1925, uh, not never to return, but never to return during the sixth pandemic. It actually comes back again during the seventh pandemic, which is considered to be an, an El Tor epidemic, a different type of cholera vibrio altogether. Uh, so the vibrio was definitely evolving and, and becoming uh, more adaptable to the environment. But this was a, a lot of this was just due to feeding people, to, to vaccinating people in strategic areas. They had very good in, in epidemic intel, epidemiologic intelligence, intelligence, and they would, you know, they had steamboats out patrolling, and they, there's, there's a case here. They would go immediately and they would start vaccinating everybody in this area and, and start feeding people and, and feeding and giving them water, right? Uh, and, and people just, just uh, the, the disease fell off drastically. But uh, in 1926, you have a few cases. 1927 is completely cholera-free. So that was their, their victory. So I'll, I'll leave it open for questions at this point. Uh, is, are we right about time? OK. Yes, Kim. So I just wonder at what point in your um, oh. Here's your mic. <laughs> Hello. This is awesome. <laughs> so um, I wonder at what point in your academic career do you realize that as a historian, you also have to know all this other stuff? I mean, you sounded like kind of a big scary biologist talking about some of these things today. And I wonder, you know, when did you kind of come to that realization that you had to be really well informed in a lot of fields and not just history? That's a great question. I, I, when I went to, to, to do my, my dissertation on cholera at the, at the University of Kentucky, one of the pieces of advice I got was to learn as much about the disease as possible. So I read every piece of scientific uh, literature that I could about it, and the modern literature, and started thinking, what can this explain about the history? And, and I think, really, I think that the, the knowledge of, of uh, more knowledge in biology and in chemistry, because chemistry is very important here, um, is, it is going to change this field. It, I think a lot of the history needs to be rewritten because of this, because they, find, they found out uh, more about the, 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 the disease itself. It's a very easy way, if you don't mind pouring through a lot of, actually I found it fascinating to go through the literature, and if you learn a lot about it, then, then you can see where some of the unexplained stuff can be explained. That, that's pretty much it, and I, um, I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. I, th I think I, I learned enough about the disease that maybe I, I'd hoped that I would add something to it. But these epidemiologists are incredible. They just they go into such detail and, and, and uh, about the disease. I really learned from them.
another question? Okay, we're good, because I've got one more. Okay. Me again. Okay, so what do you think is the takeaway for today's audience in terms of how is this study applicable to, you know, wh whether it's our understanding of history or disease or whatever? What is, what is today's takeaway? I, I think, honestly, for, for us, particularly at a community college, um, that I, the fact that they were, they, were, they were working, you know, these guys started out as physicians. Then they started calling themselves, uh, they, they actually started calling themselves bacteriologists, but really what they are is epidemiologists, right? So because there's, chem there's chemistry in there. So I think multidisciplinary uh, is, is the way to go in, in academics. I think science and, and, and it works probably better with, with the social sciences if, you all, if they all work together. Actually, this idea of famine and disorder was, has been written off for years. It's been sort of poo-pooed, oh, well, you know, so what? The, the masses were out there, who cares, you know? Well, look at the conditions, why, the reasons why they're out there, and, and then you understand maybe why the disease was, was kept appearing. Uh, and the famine, which was, was far worse even than the cholera, it was horrible. Uh, so I, I think the fact that you, ha you need to look at, at, a, at, broad, at studies broadly. Uh, you need also the specialized knowledge, but you, but you need to, to see how that applies to the broader uh, human species. Okay. Yeah, they could. <laughs> okay. Well, we had talked earlier about multidisciplinary mm -hmm. issues, and I can see, you know, different parts of even nursing, how sure. the process of the division I work in, I teach, I love this division, but starting with the Crimean, the Crimean, Crimean War. Crimean yes. War. Uh -huh. As you know, when you see the first, I'll say, more modern nursing history with Florence Nightingale and things like that, and the san unsanitary conditions, and her noticing that the uh, her patients in particular were um, starving, they were in filthy conditions, and starting to take care of those things, and seeing how that also has help just throughout history you can attribute some of that to it is that that, that absolutely makes sense to me I mean and that's about the same time with Florence Nightingale and and, and yeah absolutely <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm a little shaky on my American history now that I, I studied Russia too long but it, it was during that war that she was the Crimean there. War that's right that's right it was I, I, I forgot about that but you're, you're, you're absolutely right um, you, you do have to look at the conditions I think uh, Particularly in a, in, a, in, a, in a society like ours, which we rely on more reactive medicine, and you know, um, you, you think that well, this, there's got to be a medical, you know, there's got to be a, 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 a what, what did what did Ehrlich call it the the, um, the magic bullet that's going to stop it, right? Well, they never the Russians never found the magic bullet. They just understood it holistically, and you know, this this is a cause, this is a cause, this is a cause, this is a cause, and if if we do all this, they even felt correctly, as it turns out, that famine change, changes the, 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 bacteria, the, the bacteria itself. That, that's just known. I just read something about this. And that, uh, that not all vibrios were the same. They were looking at, at uh, some vibrios. Or, these are weaker vibrios. They called them cholerina uh, um, podobia, cholera-like. Um, so you had uh, vibrios. The Russians, what they, what they did, they didn't have all the fancy equipment and they didn't have the communications, but they, they were really smart. When they, in June, when, when people started turning up in the emergency rooms with sharp gastroenteritis, stomach sicknesses, throwing up, bloody vomiting, um, and, and even a few deaths, they knew cholera was coming. So they used this as a warning system, basically. And, and, and I think those, those all those ailments are, are probably different type of viruses that, that are known today. I, some of the viruses today, I think, are, are uh, come from estuaries. Uh, I, I'm not as familiar with them, and I don't want to venture off into that area. But I've seen a, a few of them where they, 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 they come from these regions. I, estuaries are nothing to mess with. When, it makes you think when you go to Florida and in these places and you go swimming. 
but uh, I agree. I, I think I think we need to work together. It, 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 I think it's it's you know I think territorialism and specialization has it, where it, it, it's done a lot of good. Obviously, bacteriology saved millions and millions of lives. There's no doubt about that at all. But uh, a broad approach it, it, it could be uh, warranted. I think. So I don't know about the famine. I mean, it's obviously not so simple that everybody, if they will just eat, they won't get sick. But, but who knows? Nobody's ever just, everybody hasn't eaten. <laughs> yes, young man. Thank you. Okay, so the question is about like, okay, today in our day of technology, we are very advanced and we are currently going through new, numerous studies and curing multiple diseases, why don't, why don't you think today we have been able to accomplish that? Well, I... With, with cholera. Well, for one thing, people keep, get, keep, keep starving. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have, when, when you have, like in Haiti in, in 2012, you have revolutions and, and hurricanes, and actually there was a case in, in New Orleans during Katrina, one case I, I've seen. But, yeah, of cholera, yes. Um, so probably we, we live in very good social conditions here, right? Our, our biggest problem is pretty much affluenza, right? <laughs> Rather than influenza, we're, you know, and, and, and working on this stuff, you know. But I, I, I think because of social conditions is one, uh, we, we're able to sit back and say, well, we're very advanced. You know, I, I think that's a dangerous thing to start thinking, that we're advanced and we can't be hit. Because every time, I mean, in my lifetime, the Surgeon General in the, in the 1960s, this is a well-known statement, said, we have cured epidemic disease, right? Uh, wrong. Uh, so, I, you know, we, we do better over here, but a lot of the reason we do better is, is socioeconomic conditions. Admittedly, if, if, you, if you get cancer and you get one of the best doctors over here, or some type, you know, you want it to happen here, in a, in, where we have all this knowledge. So I, I agree with you. Why do, does cholera keep popping up, in my opinion? Because socioeconomic policies end up starving people. People should starve. I mean, warfare, dropping bombs on people is, is, is really a crime. It really is. I mean, when you start having, the, probably the first people to die are, are babies because they dehydrate and, and, and the, the civilian populace suffers more. You gotta feed your soldiers, right, or they, or they can't fight. A lot of guys in Russia went into the army just so they could eat, just so they could get a coat. You know, and, and, those, and they had a, probably a better chance of survival than, than some of the people, the civilians, who are, are living lean, you know, they, and not eating at all. I mean, 1921, trust me, was just a, were just a horrible, horrible year over there. And, and some of the famines that they've uh, gone through, uh, if, if, if you, you just see some of the pictures, look at them online, 1921 famine in Russia, and just look at some of the photographs. It, it, it'll, it'll make you, it'll turn your stomach when you realize that peop, how people lived. Then you understand why, why technology is only as good as, as, as standard of living, I think. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.